Well, good evening, everyone. I am really delighted to be here tonight. My name is Erica Wagner, and I am going to be hosting this event with Tori Amos and the How To Academy. Now, Tori and I were due to meet in person later this month, but as you know, things have changed in the whole wide world since this evening was planned. So first, I'd like to say that I hope you are all well and that you're looking after yourselves and your loved ones. I'd also like to say that I know that spending time in Tori Amos's company will bring you both inspiration and solace. So a quick introduction, though none is needed. This redheaded, full-throated singer has meant business since she burst onto the music scene with her 1992 solo album, Little Earthquake. Seven of her albums have reached the top 10 on the Billboard album chart. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about her new book, Resistance, a songwriter's story of hope, change, and courage, in which she recounts her fight to keep her own voice in an industry that is often manipulative and narrow-minded. It's a book that issues a call to arms, inviting her readers to become as engaged, not only with creativity, but with politics as well. Amos, it should be said, knows a thing or two about resistance. As she writes in the book, at the beginning of her career, her record company thought girls should play guitars, not pianos, but she wouldn't abandon her beloved Bosendorfer, and it became her signature. Her 15th studio album, Native Invader, was released in 2017. On the very first page of the book are a couple of sentences that should stand out at any time but now seem eerily prescient. Make no mistake, we are living in a moment of crisis, of unprecedented crises. Note the plural. These are extraordinary times, and we are lucky to be able to talk about them with Tori Amos. Normally, at this point, I would ask for a big round of applause, and I know you are giving her one through the ether. So it's really great um, to be talking to you tonight. Tori, welcome. Erica, thank you for doing this. We've had great chats, Erica and I, so I wanted her to be the one to do the London event. And we will have that cup of tea one day with everybody else. We will, we will, but thank heaven we can do this like this now. So exactly. coming from, from Cornwall to you, take it away. Um, well, let's start by setting the scene. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit, just it's good to have a sense in these virtual events. Tell us a bit where you are and maybe how you've been doing and how you've been spending your lockdown days. I, I wonder how that affects your creativity. We were going to be on tour now on the book tour and we would have been in the States and then in the UK. So um, then we would I would come back and start recording the record and we were going to be touring in the fall. That's kind of just the arc of what I thought was happening in January and February in my mind and was planning for. So I guess um, there, there was a grief that I've had to go through accepting that I wasn't gonna see everybody because I love seeing everybody. It's something I look forward to. I love to tour, um, any kind of touring, I adore it. So this, this was a mental shift for me, an adjustment for sure. But to be able to be here in Cornwall at the studio, I'm so grateful because we're able to um, broadcast from a recording studio. The microphones are hidden, but we're in one of the recording rooms where the instruments get fixed. This is where they get healed. And this is also where guitar amps and bass amps live when we're tracking. So um, that's kind of what, what our life is. We're launching the book with different people and having Q&As and conversations with people, wonderful people like you, Professor. And then um, soon we hope to start recording the record. That's well, we might come back to, we might come back to that. Um, but now coming into the book, um, Let's take us back a bit to the beginning. You write about being in Mr. Henry's bar in Washington, DC. Maybe 
take us back a little bit to those early days. And I, because I'd like to ask you how you came to understand what was really going on in those bars in the K Street corridor in America's capital, sort of set the scene a little bit for us, how you began playing and then how you began to see the politics of Washington, DC. The only place that would give us an opportunity at first happened to be a gay bar. And I didn't really understand that culture. This was this was 1976, probably May or June of 1976. So I was still 13, soon to be 14 in August, but not yet. Um, so if we put the time frame in and realize that that subject was it just wasn't discussed, and I was in a Methodist church the Good Shepherd United Methodist Church at the time, just inside the beltway, they, they call it. You're either outside or inside that beltway and we were just inside it. So we weren't far from the nation's capital. And my father, I think was desperate that I would um, just do something because the whole dream of me being on the concert stage had ended when I got kicked out of the Peabody Conservatory at 11. So he was really, really, oh, it was um, broken hearted, I think is fair to say. And I was rebelling, I think. And uh, so this was this huge moment where when I realized, oh my goodness, all these people are men and they're, they think my dad was in a costume and so once I began to understand, I started to watch his reaction. And once they really realized that it wasn't a joke, the patrons realized, then they started to help us and give us advice. And, and within several weeks, they found a place for me to audition called Mr. Smith. And I started working there. The record family gave me a, a, a chance there. And um, then I was there for a year and my parents chaperoned. And then after that, I went on to play happy hour through, through all through Washington at many different hotels for many years. And I call it underscoring the liquid handshake. So tell us a little bit more about that underscoring the liquid handshake, because again, I think you know we're talking about your book, as I said in my little introduction, a lot of what you write seems very prescient now because what's happening with the pandemic seems to be underscoring to me a lot of the inequalities in the world and revealing the way that politics operates. So you were maturing as a musician, but you're growing up as a young woman and you're beginning to perceive what's going on between mostly the men, I would think, in these Bars. Tell us a little bit about coming to understand the operation of politics in that way. This was a time when um, cocktail hour was really, really accepted, particularly in the States. I know it's more accepted in Britain and has been, whereby after work, people will go to a pub and have a pint and talk and chat outside even if it's freezing cold and that's just what it it looks like all across England um, but in the states it's changed somewhat however at that time people would be coming in from you know early afternoon to have these business deals um, the lobbyists really are running Washington and I didn't understand how that worked and I didn't understand uh, how really white collar crime was able to be legalized through these different connections. And then by putting money into a politician, how you could have leverage with that politician. So I was learning that. And at the time, one of the Koch brothers was running on the libertarian ticket for the vice presidency. Um, and 
therefore Ronald Reagan was running on the Republican ticket and Jimmy Carter was running. And I saw a whole nation change as I was playing and listening to people's forecasts and trajectory of what they thought was going to happen. But because of the American hostages in Iran um, not coming back, it, it pushed the psychology of the masses in the states to want a different type of leader, one that was war, uh, more war driven. And um, people that I knew before, right before my eyes changed, that was what that time was about. And I think that there's a real, there's a mirroring of that and 2016, which in hindsight, we can see now how did that happen? How did we get there? And to run full circle here, 2010 Citizens United, when they um, the judgment was ruled in their favor, then anonymously you can you can really donate as m much money as you want, and then I was, I was just um, going to say for our, for our English or maybe. Um, other people who are not in the United States. Listeners, Citizens United is the act that that allows kind of unlimited funding um, for political parties in the United States, isn't it? So that's, um, that's how that has continued to affect um, politics. And backed by the Koch brothers' money. Yeah. So the Kochs, the Mercers, there, there are certain people that are, are huge investors, endless amount of money on the GOP side. So that's the Citizens United connection with 1979, 1980 election. How do you think, how do you think growing up in this atmosphere affected your progress as an artist, as a songwriter and a musician? Well, I wanted to get away from it because at a certain point I was really bummed that this type of what I began to see and understand as how business as usual, the level of corruption. And that was just um, a heartbreaker. So I, I was running to the West Coast at 21 to try and find, I don't know, a, a different way. So that that's part of why I went out west to get away from that world. But I'll tell you, Erica, I always got pulled back. I was always getting pulled back to Washington over the years and through different events where I just found myself there in the oddest times touring um, touring when George Bush, George W, uh, announced across town, I was playing at DAR, um, Daughters of the American Revolution Constitution Hall, the night that he announced we were going to war. He, he announced it in the afternoon. So I, I designed the set list around that, that we were going to war in Afghanistan. One of the themes of the book, I would say, and you alluded to it just now, is the way that um, the personal and the political are always intertwined for you. And you return at the beginning of a book, at the beginning of the book, to a subject which I think your, your fans and admirers know, which is what happened to you personally as an artist in the aftermath of the first album that you made, Why Can't Tori Read? and the way you had to define yourself as an artist and really go it alone. And you use a phrase when you're writing about it that I, I really like and I think can be very useful for people. When you had this setback of people not wanting that first album, you talk about reviewing your skills inventory in thinking about how you could go forward. Can you expand? on that for our virtual audience? Well, I was really uh, on my knees 
in in um self with self loathing and um betrayal of my instrument and that i bought into the idea of corporate music um culture and i i bought into it because i had fought for so long sending my demo tapes in and had gotten so many rejections that at a certain point i thought if i don't do something then i'm going to die here in the piano bar god knows how old um but i won't get out and i just couldn't i couldn't live with beer being slung over me and on the piano depends on the place you are in the better hotels might not have as much of that but then the lesser hotels and believe me i played both in in la for sure um but i couldn't i couldn't continue for too much longer i know it was unsustainable after 13 14 years of doing it and so um i bit I, I drank the Kool-Aid and told myself it would be okay, just fill the slot and do it. So the failure of doing that was much bigger than why can't Tori read not happening. It was going from having such a childlike, um, magical love for music that had become this monster experience. And through the failure of that record, I began to mine, um, excavate what I had left. And I thought, well, what I have to have is self-respect for what I'm creating. And that means if nobody plays it, we have to start there because you're not guaranteed success with anything, but you're really not guaranteed success when you say, I'm not playing the game. I'm not playing the game. So that's a huge place because people think and just say, get out of my office. Mm -hmm. And you have to know that going into that. But I was willing to, to even go back to playing wherever I had to play after that, saying, if I have to stay in the bar till I retire, then I'll do that to wake up with my self-respect. So when you talk about reviewing the skill set, it was, do I have the discipline to stick to this covenant that I'm remaking with the muses? Do, do I have that? And, and will I stand by that commitment no matter what? And it was, well, I can't go through what I've just been through because that's artistic and almost soul death. And I can't do that again. So that was the... I call it a covenant, I think, that yes, was me. Yes, yeah, and that's a wonderful, that's a, a wonderful uh, word in that context. And you referred just then uh, to the muses, and it brings me on to a question about your artistic practice. In the book, you refer to the songs in the third person as she, and it's clear that while you create them, the that force, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, also feels external or a little bit beyond your control. And I, I wonder if, if that's correct, if I'm getting that right, and, and also how you think we can all perhaps cultivate those forces within ourselves. I've been hearing them since I was little, and they don't come every day. Um, when I'm trying to compose. So it's not as somebody asked me, do you just get the sprinkle dust? Well, I no, it doesn't always work. They don't always show up. So it there has to be a collaborative um, kind of marriage. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, whereby I'm pushing things and developing things and researching hundreds and hundreds of entries of music that I've been doing since 2017 for this next project for this new record. So it's it's in the um, being a good scribe and listening back and doing 
really efficient notation. Um, I have books that I fill in and and register the date and what it's called. And then the time, because some of, some of these things go on for 11 and 13 minutes when you're trying to push it out. Sometimes you're just trying to um, improvise with an eight bar phrase that they gifted. And then it's trying to push that. And in listening back, sometimes I realize, well, this isn't, this is just boring. This isn't going anywhere. I haven't done anything with this gift that I was given by them. But then I'll hear something where I've taken it and collaborated with it that seems to sing a bit better or just have a little bit of a force and energy to it. And then I start building out the bones. So that's the collaboration. It takes a lot of work. It's not just being um, a receptor, but then it is about working with the seeds that you're given. And you write very much about, um, and what you've just described is also a process that involves discipline. You know, the, one of the things I say to my students when I'm teaching is, you know, I, I do believe in that gift of the muses, but I like to think that the muses, they want to find you at your desk. That's, that's how I f feel about it, kind of ready, ready to listen and, and prepared with, with your attention. And it's interesting, too, what you describe of, of getting something out, and then it sounds like it's a process of, of refinement. Yeah, and it can last for months and sometimes years with certain songs where they just don't come together. And it, it is um, a bit of trial by fire sometimes. It, it does take, when I use this word, I want to use it carefully because it, it takes diligence. I was about to say work, but I changed it because the word work is a funny word. I think as as an artist, you're developing skills to listen, to um, to try different things, to push the possibility of of what a piece can be. And sometimes I I push it in a way I've I've put in a second bridge. I love a I love a good old bridge, and and I realize you know this is just trying too hard. I'm trying too hard to shove this in here and make this work and it just doesn't belong here. But sometimes that takes a while to understand. So yeah, we have to do our part with the muses and, and um, it takes energy though to do that. And especially in this time, people have asked me, they say, how are you motivated in this time? It's a challenge. There's some days I'm more motivated than others. I'm not gonna pretend because there's so many unknowns that we don't know. And this unknowing makes us feel out of control. The whole kind of agreed house arrest has a huge uh, uh, feeling that uh, I think the only way out of it for me is now working with it, writing with it, and writing myself out of these trapped concepts. So actually reflecting on what's happening now. Yeah, and writing toward it and writing out of it. I talk about um, in the book, writing my way out of hell at one point. And sometimes I think that's the only way out. That's the only way out sometimes of anxiety for me is to surrender to the anxiety, let it take over and then let it find its way in the music and it might be frantic rhythmically or it might be like a paralysis. Somebody talked to me about creative paralysis. And so then it's like, okay, my favorite saying, if it's too loud, turn it up. Then, then take it, make the piano, be paralyzed with it and you work through it. And that's hard because Mary was paralyzed um, and, and had a tragic stroke. So working through that, it's almost as if, what was Mary teaching me through that and how can I create with 
all the things we learned through that tragic experience. Well, and that brings me, I was going to ask you, um, Mary, of course, is your mother who died sadly last year. Um, and she's such an important figure in your life. And it's very, it's striking what you say right now about now reflecting on that paralysis that she suffered in a very different way in this moment. One of the things you also talk about in the book is the way that um, her giving up work to be a minister's wife and how she perhaps regretted that, but that that led to a very important, her very important role in, in your life. Um, what does that say about her role, I wonder, and in a larger sense, women's different roles in the world? I wonder how you thought about that then and maybe how you think about it now, especially being a, a mom yourself. Well, she really sacrificed um, pretty much everything for her family. And I think it it upset her father, Papa, and Nanny, her mother. They'd saved to send her to college and then university. That was the dream. That was the plan to get out of the mill, going to the mills and working in the mills, that um, life. And so when she ran off and got married with my father and then pretty much devoted her life to working. She worked in a dean's office in, in, in a university after that. And she held several jobs just to support them. So she gave up her education. And yet, um, when I would talk with her about it, she said, but my life is here with you. And she was my best friend. And as a little girl, I spent so much of my time with her and then when I started touring, she'd come out on tour and we'd hang out together. And there wouldn't be a lot of people on tour, especially in 92. And she'd come out with me and John Witherspoon and that would sometimes, and a sound engineer, and that would be it. That was it. And we just had this relationship that without, without her, I don't, well, I wouldn't see the world the way I do. I wouldn't have written the songs that I, eventually figured out that it was my um, path to write, what kind of writer I wanted to be, and then becoming it and um, choosing to still explore that path. One of the things that comes across in the book, in over the course of the whole book, is the way that and you've just referred to the path that you're on, is the way you want to be when you're playing always very responsive to the situations that you're in, the circumstances that you're in. You don't go out on a concert tour just with a set list that you play over and over again. Tell us a little bit about how that process of listening and responding to an audience, a political situation, a particular context of time. How do you make those decisions and how does it work for you? Well, look, I think as a, you can choose what force field you want to be part of. Do you want to be really present and documenting what is really happening or do you want to, in a way, help people um, to escape what's happening? Well, I think, again, that escaping what's happening isn't the most interesting thing, unless, of course, there's an attack that's happening. And if there's an attack, then I understand the need possibly to escape. But if there's an attack narratively, which has been going on for a while now, uh, it's a war of ideas, who's controlling that narrative? Now we're back again to the K Street Quarter, which is what they were doing with those think tanks then, building them then, and figuring out if we go into college campuses and we change that narrative economically, philosophically, 
blah, blah, blah. And because they're funding those universities, then they have a different narrative that they're pushing and seeding the students. Any of us can be groomed, any of us, unless we realize that we can be and that we're really drilling down on the subjects. Um, and, and how do we find the answers to our questions? So for me, a lot of it is listening to people come to the shows, having those convos, and then we create together that night. We're creating a force field, we're creating an energy, and we're responding to what we've heard is happening that day. And we're responding to those twisted narratives that are happening that week and that day. And that's power. That is artistic power and empowerment for all of us co-creating together because we're all weaving this story together. We are. I'm, I'm one of the vessels, yeah, but I get that. But I don't see it as uh, I'm here and they're there. I'm seeing this circular movement of energy and that we're shifting things together through our chakra system to the earth. Um, and if some of these narrative thieves are out there doing their rallies, then why aren't we having our audio communion with each other and holding that energy as well? Why not? That's called being, you know, active. That, that's that's our active way. And that makes me think there are so many moments in the book, but you write both about being on your the, the strange little tour in the autumn of 2001, when the attacks of September the 11th happened. And I also think about your most recent, the Native Invader tour in what I think of as the aftermath of the 2016 elections. And of course there were upheavals here in Britain too in 2016 with the referendum over Brexit. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about those being so present in those two very different moments of trauma. And then after, after that, we have, some, we have some questions from our audience. So we'll, we'll have some time for those. Well, after September 11th, a couple weeks later, I did a signing in New York City and people would be in line and say to me, whatever you do, don't cancel because we need a place to gather. We need a place right now to gather. They're telling us all um, not to you know, go out. And there, there was a lot of fear and there was the narrative I'm drumming constantly for war. So Mark and I had decided that we would go out, that, that we would take our infant with us who was just over a year old at the time, we felt called and we felt that we, we felt safe. We just did. And yes, sometimes there would be dogs that would come into the theaters and um, check for anything in the theater to make sure people were safe. So we were trying to take the precautions and yet we thought it was imperative that we were out there at that time this is also a time when Imagine the Song by John Lennon had been banned on the radio. I can understand why they were banning certain songs with the word airplane in it. I get that kind of mentality. But to ban Imagine told me pretty much everything I needed to know. And that meant that the war of ideas did not want the idea of Imagine living life in peace. They didn't want us to imagine that. So understanding that songs can be dangerous and that that was a threat to the Hawks and their, and their um, war of ideas, I just said, okay, I'm gonna go out there and learn and we're gonna put different messages out there. And on that tour, that's when Scarlet's Walk was really being lived. We were living it. 
and then it started to write itself afterwards. 2016, we were out there trying to process, I think, where America had chosen to go. It's very complex how it chose to go when, when um, you know, the president of the United States didn't win the popular vote, but there you go. So it's the system that we have in the States. And so learning um, and feeling people's emotions and working through that in the States, but also working through with Europe and the UK, just everything that people were feeling at the time. I want to um, turn now to uh, the questions that we asked for. People submitted their questions uh, to this event. And so I have some of them here. And so I will say um, who, who asked them um, and then turn to you. So um, we have a question which I've said is from Serena, but this came up a couple of times. And she asks, given that when you started writing the book, no one could foresee this whole pandemic situation. Has your view on the book and what it means changed? Well, I did not see this coming. I don't know if doctors did. They, some have been warning us, um, but the book writing about collective trauma, this is a cataclysmic time for all of us and global as we know. And I don't remember going through or feeling anything like this before. So I guess to have written something that is trying to um, talk about an artist, um, well, an opportunity for artists to address really heavy subjects, usually subjects that not everybody wants to talk about if we're honest about each other. Some of us want to talk about it, but not all of us want to talk about it. A lot of times we want music that, that is just supporting our busy lifestyle and us going out and that type of thing that's not too heavy. But now things are so heavy that I think there is an opportunity to write towards that heaviness and to write towards what's coming up for people mentally, emotionally in a lockdown, in a, in a time where some people are feeling trapped, some are feeling lonely, some are feeling like they're getting a rest. It depends what, what your situation is. If you're getting a rest, you might want to trade places with husband if you don't want to rest anymore because he would love a rest. <laughs> um, and that kind of brings me uh, to a question from um, Erica, another Erica, um, who asks then, how do you harness the power of resistance without letting anger or fear take over? Well, right now, I'm... I'm definitely resisting despondency because when I think of what can happen and us not knowing the answers, how long can this go on for uh, if, if you're playing by the rules, meaning if you're trying to follow the guidelines and, and use your logic and be sensible about it, um, how long will it be till I can see my family in the States again. Well, I don't know. There, there are so many unknowns. So that's really um, how I have to resist getting into that space in, in my mind that, um, that paints a bleak picture, opposed to going to that place of presence and saying, OK, then write to this. You have a piano, you have that. Be grateful you have that. You have, you're at a recording studio. So if that's what you're feeling, then write about it. Now, it might not be something that makes the record. That's okay. You, you always write more songs, I do anyway, than go on a record. But sometimes you just have to write to survive the moment. And when I say survive, I'm talking about 
more than survive. I'm to create with the moment, to create with it. And sometimes certain emotions are harder to allow um, because they can feel heavy. We're back to that heaviness. So how do you bring that into magic? And that's that's the paradox. And that's where I think the tension of it is and, and the magic in a way when you when you can be part of that. But it takes it takes discipline. Um, let's see. Uh, Koi asks, how do you find a poetic or creative angle when addressing news and current events in your lyrics? I find it difficult to write songs, says Koi, about political topics I feel passionate about in an artful way. Hmm. Well, if you want to try doing it, it, it might be when we talked about before, Erica, about um, reviewing your skill set. You can, you might, Koi, since you are a songwriter, you can clearly um, write songs. So maybe you take it from the angle of, of how it makes you feel emotionally when you're reading these things, because it's, you're talking about control issues, about people with unbelievable amounts of power that are misusing it. And really, it's like being in a in a, um, a d domestic abuse relationship with some of these senators, <laughs> honestly. So you can take it to the personal and put your twist on it. Um, it doesn't always have to be about literal policy. That isn't our job. That's the job of the, um, you know, the political journalists. That's the job of the Sarah Kinziers and the Andrea Chalupas of the world over at Castlet Nation, who I just had the privilege of talking with very recently to the point where they were able to really land some political thoughts in my mind that if it that are going to inspire me to go write a song, but I can't do it in the way that those two formidable, um, badass political journalists think of things. And they said I wrote it down, and I, I actually, um, Erica, I dropped it on um, WNYC yesterday. But it came from Andrea and Sarah Kenzier when they were talking. I asked them about the election coming up. And what Sarah said, and Andrea had amazing thoughts on this, hopefully this will air in, in the next week, that interview. But it hit home when Sarah said, we are not voting for a person, but a system of government. We are going to vote, she said, for either a sort of version of democracy, or we're going to vote for an authoritarian government, similar to Putin's government. Variation on the theme, but it's a gaggle of oligarchs and it, that's what they're going for. So when she really crystallized that for me, it just made me, it was like a pow. It's just, this is what we're doing. Tor, don't get confused. Don't think about the personalities for five seconds. You need to think about the system of government you're voting for and anything else, you're getting groomed and distracted and wake up. I was like, whoa, that's why Gaslit Nation, man. And now I'm inspired to go write something. It won't be how Sarah writes or how Andrea writes because I can't write like that. Answering Koi's question, I just, I can't, th I don't think like them. I don't have that brain, but I'm going to write something because they inspired me, but it'll be in my way. This is a question that's really about the structure of the, the business that you're in from Elysia. And she asks, um, she's a musician. You shared a similar energy to the underground riot girl feminist punk movement in the 90s, bands like Slater Kinney, Bikini Kill, but you were always on a major label path. Corporate music seems to have a full stranglehold on art now. What's your relationship to truly underground music? And what's your advice for artists 
in a time when culture does not seem to value them? Mm. Well, culture hasn't valued them in the way that they can and possibly through this unbelievable crisis might start to need manna from artists like you and your contemporaries that are going after the stuff instead of really some some acts are there to um well, I don't necessarily know why they're there, but I know why they're signed, some of them. And I'm not going to, we're not going to get into mentioning things. But what's important here is to understand how the music business works. If you understand how um, the levers work, then you can decide your strategy. And it is about a strategy. So in the 90s, how it would work, and I knew it very well then, was that advertisers had so much power on the radio. Now advertisers still have power. Not all advertisers are um, pro-life, anti-choice, but some are. Not all advertisers are against um, feminism and equal rights for all, but some are against that. So you have to kind of figure and it's just, um, it's a, it's dirty and it's grimy, but it is what it is. It's a bit yuck, but it's corrupt and that's this is how it goes. We're back to a war of ideas. That is what's going on. We, we can outcreate them, but it takes, we're back to discipline, determination, and you, you have to, and defiance. <laughs> and so, they're putting money into that time slot so they might not want our messaging and if they don't agree with it politically or ideologically then they they're not going to want our music when they're pushing their burger or their this or their that and you have to also think if the masses are really being empowered then how are they going to get them to buy all this crap so once you understand how it works, and for corporate music, sometimes it's just much easier for them to sign people who they can place their work and stuff that doesn't ruffle too many feathers. There is a side to this that's about commerce, but it is about um, what the public demands. And the public might just be hungry for something else, something more substantial. And so I think this is, we're back to an opportunity, but you have to seize it. Because you can say some, some of us got lucky by being in the 90s, but you also make your own luck. You do. It, it might take a lot of energy and persistence, but y you have to do it. Matthias asks, you recently mentioned a graveyard of your songs. How mm -hmm. many songs are in it? And are these finished songs? Uh, not all of them are finished, but some of them are. I, too many to count, really. But that's okay. They're fine. They dance around at night. <laughs> yeah, they're fine. Silly. They're okay. Um, Threnody's question is a little bit connected to um, Elysia's question that you were just speaking to. What advice would you give to a young female singer-songwriter in this current socio-political landscape? Well, I've just explained to you how that side of the music business works, how it can operate. So knowing that there are, there are more independent um, uh, labels out there and then there's the internet and people have also written in and talked to us Elysia wrote great stuff for us by the way about the frustration of putting work out in a sea of millions of other people's work and getting lost and how it's almost as if how is there going to be uh, a side of music business that isn't all corporate. And this is very valid, I understand. But we're in 
a time we've never been in before. So I'm encouraging the singer songwriters to write toward what they feel they need to address at this time. Don't write toward getting a record deal. Write toward getting to the person on the other side of your instrument across the room that's barely making it through the day or that doesn't know how they're going to fulfill their dream and go to college. So I think you can document this time. Some some of you might want to just ease people's pain and, and sing them very different music than um, documenting their pain. You might want to be trying to heal it in a different way. So I think that there's People need music right now, like never before. How you get it to them? Well, I don't have I don't have the answers, but I do think that this is an an unusual time, and and that kind of corporate music isn't going to necessarily um, be that healing elixir that people are desperate for right now, and they're desperate. I, and I, I must, I would say that I've always felt as a critic and, and as an artist that people are smart and people respond to the authentic. They want the authentic. And as you say, they, they especially, they especially want it now. There's a hunger for it now. Um, but like you said, you just, you have to, you have to do it. Um, Misty asks, in the chapter, Mary's Raven, you acknowledged a letter you received from a woman about grief. In retrospect, you said you didn't understand until it happened to you. Now experiencing it, would you have responded differently? Hi, Misty. Yes. Oh yeah, I'd respond differently because I couldn't understand the emptiness I couldn't understand um, the level of loss. I thought that because of what Mary had gone through that I would be relieved because she was suffering. So naturally, logically, I would say to myself, you know, if you love this person, then you're going to almost, for them, think finally they're free. Well, that didn't happen for a long time. And so when this woman wrote me about her grief and the level of pain in that letter, I couldn't understand it. I just couldn't understand it. I had empathy for the woman. I heard her but because I hadn't experienced that kind of loss where my best friend in the world, the person that had taught me so much and the person that um, never raised a voice to me, just unconditional love, uh, that was gone. And it, it was just bleak and gone for a while. So I would have addressed this in the letter. And I think the woman would have felt more supported because she was going through so much that I couldn't understand till I went through it. And then when I went through it, that woman's letter helped me because I realized I wasn't alone, that this is what you go through. This is what some people go through when they lose someone they love. Lorenzo asks, what would you say to a person that a person self-silenced for decades could do to break free from the chains of convention and to allow that person's true inner silent voice to be heard finally, to unleash a repressed inner self? Wow, congratulations, first of all. That's huge. That takes courage. Well done. You, um, for so long, we can become who other people want us to become, or we, what do they say? Not just fight or flight, but freeze or fawn. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating how when we freeze, 
or fawn to make other people not confront us or unveil us or um, be upset or angry with us. We, we find ways to hide pieces of ourself. We just put them in different drawers. We segregate them in order to survive sometimes, especially if there's a domineering um, personality that you're dealing with. So, or there's an expectation of you being a certain way to carry on the family name, or there's a certain religious belief. And so, the idea that if if you become who you really feel you are, that you're betraying those who, who you love. These are really difficult um, concepts to say, I'm not wearing that. I can't take that on board. They're projecting, you know, they want me to live a life they want me to live. Well, that's the thing. If somebody really loves you, then they will want you to live the life you want to live. We just have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's, here's a good one from Linda. What have you found to be the best way to deal with men in male dominated industries when you have perhaps been treated like a lesser being because you're a woman? Well, uh... Sometimes I haven't dealt with them so well be, because, um, you know, that's the thing about battling for your art. Some, sometimes you're banging your head against a wall and I wish that I had figured out how certain people hear what's going to be effective instead of just trying to get them to understand the problem. They don't necessarily, not all of them, some do want to understand the problem, but some don't. So the question is, how do you get them to hear so that you can get to the place that you're trying to get to? And you don't want unresolved. That That's no good. That doesn't get anybody anywhere. So it's about figuring out how does this person hear and what's the way? What are the words? How do you approach them? Because sometimes people um, are more open by you telling a story and them coming up with the idea. <laughs> sometimes you just have to go, yeah, let them come up with it. That's fine. So it's understanding how to get to achieve what you want. And for a long time, it took me a long time to get that though. I didn't just get that. I did it by <laughs> doing it the wrong way and not and ending up like this because it was their way or my way. And sometimes, you know that saying, you have to be smart, not right. <laughs> Let yeah. them be right. Yeah, very good. That was Linda's question in case I didn't say. And then last, last quick question from Anna perhaps impossible to answer. She asks, if you weren't a singer songwriter, what or who would you be? A sandwich maker. I like to make sandwiches. I'm not saying they'd be good. Okay, but you like to make them. Yeah, I mean, I think they'd be good. They okay. wouldn't be, they might not be a chef's sandwich, but they're my nieces and nephews which is they'll they'll get me to make them all sandwiches very good well i think that's i like the image of you making sandwiches to close this wonderful encounter on i look forward to the time when you and i can actually share a sandwich and we will erica i'm going <laughs> to potter over to your flat in london and see the professor's office very good and good luck grading i know you're going to do an amazing job Thank you. And we've had great chats. This and I can't, can't wait to see you in person. Indeed, me too. Thank you so much, Tori. Thank you so much. Good night.